Welcome to our backyard. This is the Backyard Philosophy Podcast. We are two friends having a discussion after everyone else has passed out or gone to bed. Grab a drink and listen as we discuss everything from automation, space exploration, and why the meaning of life is 42. Italians from ancient Rome building the Colosseum to Italians in New Jersey making cement shoes. Concrete has been involved in humanity's construction for a long time. And in today's episode, we're going to be talking about it and how it came to be. But before we get into that, Nick, how are you and what are you drinking? I'm doing great. And what do I, what am I drinking? I'm drinking a collection of leftover beer. Uh, but right now I'm drinking Always Down by 10 Barrel Brewing. And uh, it tastes like an IPA, which I'm not a huge fan of, but it is free. So it's the most delicious of all beers in that sense. Concrete. You know, I just thought we should have made concrete mixer shots for uh, for this, what, but uh, hindsight's What goes into that? Uh, I think it's just lime, whiskey, and Irish cream. Oh, that sounds disgusting. Yeah, well, <laughs> so does drinking cement, but here we are. Uh, it turns out cement... It's a little more interesting than you might think. It's uh, there's a whole subculture, whole hidden world, everything from mafia to the world running out of resource to skyscrapers going up, but it all starts with history. And Nick, why don't you lead us into the history? So the oldest use of concrete dates back to 6,500 BC in Syria and Jordan, and it's just a series of cisterns and houses that was used by traders which i'm not going to pronounce because i don't know how to say that nabati sure <laughs> again i don't know how to say it so i was just going to skip it see you just go you just say it with confidence and then and then if people believe you yeah but also someone's going to hear it pronounced wrong and be like these fucking idiots <laughs> i mean are they wrong <laughs> we're not exactly the brightest bulbs that's you're not wrong so <laughs> <laughs> But that's a long time ago. I mean, I guess I never really thought about when we started using concrete. I mean, I assume, obviously, I know the Romans used concrete. And I didn't think it was a new invention, but I didn't think it was that old. Yeah, I honestly, I'm in the same boat. I thought it was like, maybe like when the Egyptians were building a pyramid, China was building the Great Wall, somewhere around there, which is like 3000 BC, which they were using. But add another 3500 years to that. Then you start getting to the beginning of it. And you know, we only came across it because it was widespread at that point. So there's surviving archaeology of it. It probably even predates that by a thousand years. Yeah, because if the United States infrastructure is anything to show about the longevity of concrete, it doesn't last too long. (laughs) Yeah, well, oh, God. I have some stories that I might share with uh in the episode or maybe off air but we'll see how that one goes but yeah most of the i guess to be fair not to to the infrastructure of the united states but there's a lot of concrete structures that are still standing from a long time ago like you mentioned the the pyramids all, as well as the great wall of china or some big ones well you gotta keep out that you mongolians. gotta keep out the mongolians but really the romans were the ones who really got into the use of concrete and maybe not really into it, but they did it very well. And the what they did was the their cement. Cement is the binder in concrete, which I feel like I always use interchangeably, but because I don't know that much about concrete. So if I use it interchangeably, it's because I am an idiot. So disclaimer, but the, what the Romans use is volcanic ash because they had a lot of that. And they used uh, some seawater. And then they did a lot more, it depends who you ask, engineering to uh, improve their concrete and not just improve how to make their concrete, but to improve how it worked together. Like the aqueducts and the Colosseum were all very impressive structures that they used arches to with the concrete to employ. And so they're able to create tall structures, which we didn't see too much of. I mean, yes, the pyramids are very tall but they're They're also also very very wide and built on top of each other it's not not as freestanding a structure as the Colosseum or the aqueducts and the reason they had to 
get so good at concrete is to move water around because moving water around just in like dirt channels, you get a lot of erosion, you get a lot of sediment in the water, yet you're always fixing erosion problems, but concrete doesn't erode as fast. So once you build it, you don't really have to worry about it as much as a yearly thing after the rains to come back and fix all of your streams and, and whatever to get the water to where you want it to go. So concrete really facilitated the building of larger cities. Uh, to add on to this, the reason why it was in arches is in ancient concrete, they had no additives inside the concrete. In modern day, we use steel, rebar. You can't do that. They didn't have that accessibility. Steel wasn't even invented when they were making the Colosseum. So what they did is they used arches and arches from an engineering standpoint displace the weight evenly so it's distributing the weight evenly across the structure so there's not one focal point and that's why they're able to build such large structures that still exist today are you kidding me i go on a highway and it seems like they're tearing it up every five months they still have a coliseum which hundreds of thousands of people went to saw they flooded it multiple times to have ship fights and it's still surviving today. Nick, I'll be honest with you. They don't build things like they used to anymore. Yeah, so, and and the reason I say that is because if you listen to concrete engineer engineers, people who do concrete, they, they, I don't know, not scoff, but they feel like they're so much more intelligent than the Roman engineers, which is true, but no one in Rome used computer programs or had the history that the Romans, the foundation that the Romans built to get us to where we are today. So it feels like we should be a little bit more thankful for their their work. As a mechanical engineer, there's a little bit of rivalry between civil and mechanical engineers. A mechanical is better. Uh, civil engineers, you guys have A, computers, calculators, tons of books, and steel. They were, the, I think the most advanced technology at the time was iron. Iron's pretty soft. And they were able to do, I mean, there's a reason why all roads lead to Rome. So the Romes did have books, Mike. Marcus Vitru Vitruvius Polio said that with confidence. <laughs> wrote a book called De Architectura, where he talked about the construction of concrete and bricks. And uh, he said he talked about how bricks take two years to dry and they can't they have to be made in the spring or the fall. Other, if they're made in the summer, the outside dries and the inside doesn't, so that they appear dry, but it's actually not dry, so it'll crack. And he said that it takes two years to dry the bricks that they used. I mean, he's pretty he's pretty right. I mean, even modern concrete slabs it takes I think seven days minimum before you're allowed to walk on it, and it takes years upon years to to have it dry. Yeah, and so yeah, they used a type of cement called pozzolana which is just part of the the cement. The, so the cement, which is the binder, is volcanic ash, and he talked about using that. But it's just, I mean, I, don't, I didn't actually look up if we found this book or, you know, writing somewhere. But isn't it crazy to find, like, a, find an old manual on making concrete? Like, that'd be insane. That's not super exciting, but I guess when it, in the grand scheme of archaeological findings, but that's still pretty cool. I, I, I'll be honest, from an engineering standpoint, what Rome did is amazing. Like, it's, I don't think people realize the scale of Rome and the Roman Empire with their aqueducts, their walls, their roads, their public to toilets and baths, their coliseums, their palaces. It's an entire empire and it's something so common, but without those manuals being passed on, passed on, information gets lost and i'm surprised i've never heard about this manual and I, I guarantee you the people in medieval ages really would have killed for that manual i'm surprised we didn't talk about cement in the dark ages that would have been good to know there wasn't a big growth in cement uh in, when once rome fell but there was also a decline in cement being used as Rome fell like you said nick the romans were keen on using cement it was a good solid structure and once Rome fell, a lot of the information and knowledge got lost. That's why castles were built with bricks and not cement. I mean, yes, there's some, you could argue for some strength and resources and stuff like that, but cement structures during 
the Dark Ages and Medieval Ages heavily decreased until 1756 with John Smeaton. Yeah, so like I said, what he did is he used hydraulic lime. And I guess to get technical, this the concrete we use today is they call it hydraulic concrete. Oh my gosh. Hydraulic concrete because it uses water to help bind everything. Um, I don't know. People always talk about hydraulic cement. And so I thought that would be important to preface. And anyway, so what Smeaton did, they burned the limestone and then it turned into a substance called clinker, which is then crushed and then used as the powder or the cement in the concrete. And some of his work can be seen most notably in apparently a famous lighthouse called the Eddystone Lighthouse in Cornwall, England. That last sentence means literally nothing to me as an American. <laughs> well, <laughs> I was going to say with the lighthouse, with the lighthouse, with the lighthouse, I figured you'd been a little bit partial to liking it, especially since you live by the coast. Well, it's on the world's worst ocean, so. Ooh, ooh, shots fired across the bow early. Ugh. But to add on what you were saying with clinker, so it wasn't just limestone. It was limestone and clay, and it creates uh, a kind of a calcium-based substance once born. And in 1756, this was the first Portland cement, which Nick said is hydraulic cement, which is pretty much the same thing. The names are kind of interchangeable. It's funny enough, John Smeaton would not have the first patent on it. It wouldn't be until 1824 when a Joseph Aspen... Uh, created a patent for portland cement nearly 75 years later and he got a lot of credit and a lot of money for it and that's kind of got to suck for smeaton yeah and portland cement is pretty much the common name for most of the the concrete that cement that we we use today and it is not named after portland oregon it is named after portland england which i'm assuming and this is a hard hard second but is probably the second best portland in the world no wait there's a portland maine so third best portland uh, because (laughs) it is in europe i'm gonna agree with that and well eventually that portland cement made its way to america and once america got a hold of it the innovation the inventing the building went off like a firework and i don't know if you want to go into depth but i can do a quick run through to get us into the 20th century nick uh, yeah, you can go, and then if I have anything to add, I'll, I'll add on. So in 1889, the Alvord Lane Bridge in San Francisco was built, the first concrete reinforced bridge, which still stands today. 1891 in Belafonte, Ohio, the first concrete street, which still exists today. Also in Ohio, Cincinnati, Ohio, in 1903, the first concrete high-rise, standing an amazingly tall 16 stories. In 1908... The Union, New Jersey, funny name to me, Union, Concrete, New Jersey. That's, I feel like there's a joke there. That was the first Concrete Homes, which, after reading, is tied to Thomas Edison. Uh, I'm not quite sure if Thomas Edison financed it or Thomas Edison helped create him. Uh, either way, it's somewhere tied to his home state, New Jersey. 1913 in Baltimore, the first selling ready mix Concrete. 1915. An American by the name of Lynn Marson Scaffold made a color concrete. So now concrete is not just that gray, dull color anymore. It can come in any color you want. 1938, John Crossfield gets a patent for concrete overlay. Overlay is just like designs in concrete. So like um, imagine like, you know, the flower print or a leaf print in concrete kind of style. Like when you go under a bridge and they have all those designs or like uh, out here, it's pretty common for people to stamp salmon on the side of concrete bridges and and stuff like that. Yeah. I mean, and in 1915, bominate, a process also used to decorate concrete, was developed in America. Not quite sure what the difference is. 1963, our home state, Nick, at the University of Illinois, the first concrete stadium dome within... Within 150 years of getting hold of concrete, not only did we innovate, design, and create new things, we built a stadium out of it. Boy, the Romans would have been proud of us. Wait, did you talk about our big dams? I was going to leave that to you. I know you want to talk about the Hoover Dam. 
not just the Hoover Dam, but also the Grand Coulee Dam were constructed in 1936 as part of the FDR's, oh my gosh, I'm blanking on the New Deal, New Deal campaign. The One of the oldest concrete, the oldest concrete dams, which are still drying just because there's so much concrete in it. And another important, and I don't exactly know where to put this in the time frame because I've received, it, I guess it depends on how you define reinforced concrete. I don't know what you ran across, Mike. I heard, I saw that the first reinforced concrete structure was a boat built in 1824, but also in England in 1880, they were using steel rods uh, to reinforce concrete. But if you go way back to somewhere in the Middle East, uh, sometime BC, they had concrete bricks that were reinforced with uh, like long grass weeds basically as a, a type of reinforcement inside the bricks so i guess it really depends on what you're counting as reinforced i saw very similar things i think what most credit goes to and i could be mistaken about this goes to the ship because if i was not mistaken it was cement with a ship hull so it was the the cement and the steel weren't so much combined internally but a little bit more externally just to hold it on um but that's what i saw as like the first mainstream accepted use of reinforcing steel yeah so i i'd agree with that i just mean it's to me using I, I mean, the way it was described with like the old bricks of like it was purposely for you know providing more strength or reinforcing it so it seems like the idea has been around for a long time and it, what's interesting to me like you talked about going around the outside of the ship but during the 1850s and 1880s when they were quote-unquote reinforcing concrete it was all exterior so like the steel rods would be on the outside to prevent movement and not the interior of the concrete yeah to me that almost seems like framing less than uh than reinforcing yeah that's i would agree with that and uh since we didn't talk about it i also wanted to point out that going way way back um Around 850 to 1,000 years A.D. was the oldest concrete structure in uh, the Americas. Oh, man. I It's <laughs> Uxmal? I have no idea how to say that. U-X-M-A-L. It's in the Yucatan. It's a pyramid. It's a whole town. I mean, the whole town with pyramids. But that's the, old, that's the oldest concrete in the Americas. I'm curious what the oldest concrete is in Europe, if there's any old concrete things left that's not from the 20th century besides well obviously besides the Colosseum in rome i'm talking about more modern concrete well i think and this is conjecture well it's i know that crete the island in greece or in the mediterranean, mediterranean sea i believe they had brick roads moving through the island so I would guess that those would be the oldest, but I'm not entirely sure. Well, to play devil's advocate, brick and cement are a little different. Bricks have been made for a long time, and the main difference between brick and cement is brick is majority clay mixed in with sometimes straw uh, and, and other ma organic materials. Cement tends to be more rock and stone. It's uh, That's the main difference on top of my head that I can make it easy to skin shows of it like you can't make bricks without straws an old saying uh but yeah i i'm just i'm just curious of portland cement i mean europe's europe the, the cradle of life asia they're such old civilizations i wouldn't be surprised if there's even older stuff than that but i'm just wondering about modern concrete because uh concrete nick in case you didn't know is pretty strong uh yeah i feel like i knew that <laughs> Well, just making sure your uh, rock wasn't dropped on your head or anything. Did I? Yeah. So I, I could not. I was looking up. I couldn't find oldest concrete structure in Europe. So we're gonna have to move on. But it sounds like you're about to talk about concrete. I was gonna first talk about a major component in concrete. So concrete in general is made with clinker, which is cement. It's uh, an aggregate, which is usually like gravel, rocks, water, and sand. Now, sand is not all created equal. There are different types of sand. And sand is a big commodity. 
It's a 50 billion tons of sand are used each year. Funny fact, the Earth only produces about half of that, so we're uh, running out of sand. Now, not sand sand, but certain water sand. So there's sand in the Sahara Desert, and there's sand at your local beach. These sands are not the same. One is breaking down rocks with water. The other is breaking down rocks with wind. Wind makes sand even, little circles like silicon gel balls. While river makes it jagged and rough and different shapes. These are very vital differences in making cement. River, marine cement, so sand made by oceans, rivers, lakes. The jaggedness when put together kind of locks each other in place. You can't do that with sand made by air. It just rolls around and becomes weaker and dissipates. And just just in reference, in the United States, in 2021 alone, the United States used 109 million metric tons of sand. Sand is also the foundation for cement. In case anyone has never laid down cement, this is pretty much how the process goes. Say I wanted to build a sidewalk. You dig a hole, well, a trench, however deep it is, depending on how much weight's going to be on there. You either pat it down, put a front strain in it so water drains out. You pour in sand. You pour in gravel. You pound that down to flat. You kind of box it in with a frame. And then you pour in your cement. This is something I found really interesting, Nick, that you might think is really interesting. Between 2011 and 2013, China used more concrete than America did in the entire 20th century. I feel like that makes sense but it is still surprising it's very to me overwhelming how much that is i mean just think how much sand was probably used in the hoover dam and most of china like i said with marine sand they get their sand from the pearl river delta which is in china sand is a seven billion dollar industry and its main tie is to glass and cement 90 percent of the world beaches because of the demand for c cement, have shrunk 40 meters since 2008. The reason why we don't notice this is because we pump sand back onto the beaches. So we take the sand, or the sand naturally erodes, so not to lose tourists, we import and bring in more sand. And fun fact, you'll like this, Nick. Most of the sand rebuilding done here in America, Germany, and England is done with taxpayers' money. Well, that's just a fun, another fun thing that I paid for. Sand is extremely important to building. It's the second commodity only behind water. It's that important. Sand for our infrastructure, for cement, for making things is only behind water. And because of that, black markets have formed to create infrastructure for sand. In India and Morocco, they have created sand mafias. This isn't a joke. These mafias have killed people to steal sand. So much sand has been stolen by these mafias and countries that islands have actually disappeared from how much sand they've stolen. It's a whole fiasco. So, uh, world trade-wise, sand accounts for $1.86 billion of world trade, or 0.011%. The top exporter of sand is the U.S., and we get 370 million dollars a year from that in in 2020 it's probably going to shift here and the top importer mike guess china for sure at 244 million dollars huh we're actually giving them our land that well it's pieces of it <laughs> it's the so much sand is being disputed and moved around or stolen then 2019 malaysia banned all sea sand exports. And just to give an idea of how that sand is made is there's a couple ways. There's open pit mining, which no one really wants to do. Ocean dredging, which is the same thing as kind of river mining. So what they do is they, well, in India, they have divers who work 12-hour or 8-hour shifts just diving up and down, grabbing sand, which they die a lot. Or they have a boat with a pretty much a giant vacuum or pump to bring up sand. Now, you can make sand, but people don't like the color, so the industry is not really wanting to change. And so it's quite interesting, the export of sand to me. 
Take, for example, the tallest tower in the world, the Burj Khalifa in Dubai. It used 39,000 tons of steel, 103 square meters of glass, and 330 million liters of concrete. Dubai is a desert country, but they have the wrong sand. So they had to export majority of their sand from Australia to build this skyscraper. All this transportation, all this moving of sand, all this creating of sand is very CO2 impactful. In case you didn't realize, Nick, rock, sand, and limestone are heavy. <laughs> it's, it's not the most fun to move. And because of it, because of this, they have to use large ships to transport. And like clinker, so to create clinker, like you said, Nick, you have to burn limestone and clay. Well, that produces a lot of CO2. You have to literally burn it. Cement, not concrete, cement is 8% of the CO2 produced by the world. And that would be less CO2 than the U.S. and China produce, but more than any other country in the world. So all of India's emissions, less than the curing of concrete. Yeah, if I remember correctly, the amount of, con the amount of CO2 produced from cement is four or five times the the amount of airplanes burning of CO2 in the United States. And I'll be honest with Nick, there's a lot of flights going around the world constantly. That's pretty impressive. When it comes to CO2 in cement, it's almost a one-to-one -one ratio. So one ton of cement produces one ton of CO2. It's not exactly one-to-one, -one, but it's close enough where people round. So it's like, if I remember the exact figure, it's one ton of cement for like 0.87 or 0.93 or something like that, tons of CO2. So it's still extremely, extremely high. And fun fact, because we are now running out of sand, uh, in case, remember, like I said, we use 50 million tons and the earth only produces 25 million tons. The amount of money going into, one, try to create new cement, but two, making the price of cement and concrete go up is quickly growing. So much so that the, even the ho the housing market is starting to get more expensive because of sand. If you didn't think houses were expensive now enough, it's going to get more expensive. And to piggyback to what you're saying about how widely utilized it is, 150 tons of concrete are poured every second. Per year, around 14 billion cubic meters of concrete are cast every year. I'll be honest with you. That's no idea what the number means either. That's so unfathomable. Like, I, I wish they like did it on how many coliseums were built or something like that. Yeah, or like a X by X road to the, would stretch to the moon. I don't even know. But yeah, that's that's wait, how how many per second? 150 tons every second. I feel like you could go to the earth in like a in in less than a day with how much cement is being poured. And it's not just sand that's a heavy use. We mentioned it earlier with reinforcing. It's steel, which is also an issue when it comes to concrete. So a one meter cubic slab of concrete has a ratio of about 1% to 1.5% of steel to its wet weight. So on average, one cubic meter of concrete weighs about 7,850 kilograms. So what kilogram is 2.2 pounds. So like around what, 1500 pounds, right? Asking the wrong person. It'd be more like 1700 pounds. Well, anyhow, since you need about 1% of that, you'll need about 78.5 kilograms of steel. So that's, so for 17,000 pounds of concrete, you need about, I don't know, 180 pounds of steel. That's a, that adds up really fast. In case you didn't realize, Nick, uh, steel is getting kind of more expensive, especially now that America is producing a lot less of it. Well, I mean, I, I think at this point it's fair to say everything's getting more expensive. Touche, touche. But something's very funny to me with steel. We've constantly throughout humanity have, we've constantly throughout humanity have tried to make concrete better, try to make cement better. And we thought we did it with steel rebar. Which we did. So it helps with tensile strength and compression strength, which pretty much is different movements and different forces on the cement. But there's an interesting side effect of having reinforced concrete. Concrete with 
rebar, steel frames, rods in there. Well, these rods eventually will rust, and the concrete deteriorates due to rust. The rust starts adding more oxygen inside the concrete, starts creating stress fractures, starts creating holes, more air pockets, divots, hence making concrete break faster. So yes, our concrete is stronger, but perhaps the Romans were wiser for not adding additives into their cement. Because of that, no rust, no micro cracks, the Colosseum is still somewhat standing today. Um, another big problem with modern concrete is how much it creeps. So creep means as it dries, it shrinks. And over time, with weather, it expands and contracts due to heat and cold. So if you ever go on a sidewalk and you see those little paths that are cut in between, that's not for how big the mold is. That's to allow movement. So that way the concrete doesn't rub into each other, doesn't crack, doesn't fracture. It has give into it. It's weird to think about something that could weigh hundreds if not thousands of pounds moves and contracts, but it does. That's another big difference between our concrete and the ancient concretes, the amount of movement and creep. Yeah, so, and I bring this up because that's the comparison that everyone makes, right, of how is it that the Colosseum is still standing and the, the roads built a few years ago aren't? So I've gotten a few different answers, and I want to know what you thought, but the two answers that I got is, at least for roads, Rome is not a cold climate. Their temperature extremes are nothing like we see in the United States. Another big factor in that is that it's not steel reinforced and we use salt on our roads and that salt permeates into the concrete, into the rebar, which causes the rebar to rust which the rusting rebar can expand up to seven times its initial size, cracking the concrete. And so I guess my question is, is it because we use salt on our roads, or is it because Rome is such an easier climate that their concrete doesn't have to contract and expand as much as it does in most of the United States? I think it's a little bit of everything, to be honest with you. Uh, so, for example, we'll start with roads. Rome did build a lot of roads, but... They weren't exactly using concrete. They are usually using cement as mortar for rocks. And if you look at the pre-existing ones, there are, par there are parts of the road which have been so worn from wagon wheels that it divots in. Now imagine giant divots in modern roads. Well, we call them potholes now, which are kind of everywhere, but that's another big thing. And also the amount of weight on these structures. I, I imagine an average highway, how much, how much foot traffic it gets. It wears things down faster. I imagine with the aqueducts, let's, let, I imagine there wasn't a lot of foot traffic. You had the water from the mountains and rain. And that kind of brings us into weather. Yes, Rome is relatively neutral, but they also built their structures to kind of support their own weight. So a big thing with dams, that's why a lot of dams still exist today, is you can't have any support structure. You have to be geometrically self-supportive. So that's why things like the Hoover Dam still exist and stuff like that. It's different engineering. It's different mindset. It's, um, I mean, let's be honest. If we look at like the New York Empire State Building on how tall that is to compare to what Rome did, it's very different. One's going to take a lot more maintenance because there's a lot more concentrated weight. I mean, what's force? Pressure over times area. So we're having a lot more weight in a concentrated area for skyscrapers compared to these buildings built in ancient Rome or China or Egypt. With the reinforcement, though, I think it is correct. Like we were both saying with the steel rods. Yes, it makes it stronger to make us go taller, but I think it also shortens the lifespan of concrete, which is another question. Are we building for function or are we building for reliability right and that's another i think you brought up another important fact but didn't ex expand upon it of traffic of roman roads don't see the vehicle traffic that american roads do the i mean just the even today the culture of of cars in italy is is not the same as the united states oh not even not even close i mean does italy have any 
pickup trucks sold there. I know England has some barely ones. They have those ones. little tiny ones. Even their fire trucks are like a quarter of the size of our fire trucks. Weight makes a difference, Nick. I'll be honest. If you're putting heavy stress on an object, heavy being the key word, it's not going to last as long. But I never answered your question with salt. I think salt also pays a huge part. When researching cement a little bit, I saw pretty much no benefit for salting the roads. I mean, down south in Texas, we use sand, which a lot of south does. I mean, I'm not sure on the safety factor, but I know for salting the roads, it diminishes the quality and lifespan of the concrete. The salt or the sand does? The salt. Yeah. we In Oregon, we use sand too. And so I guess I'm just curious of why some states use salt and some use sand. That's a good question. I didn't come across that in my research. Um, but I do know, along with concrete, asphalt's also affected by salt. I have, the only really difference, main difference between asphalt and concrete is asphalt uses asphalt in its mixture, but it's pretty much the same mixture as concrete. Wait, okay. So asphalt uses what in its mixture? Asphalt. Which is? Uh, it's Isn't it like tar and ash? Uh, and, and then, sorry, so it's getting multiple things mixed up in my head. So... Uh, one thing that the Roman roads do have over American concrete is because of the volcanic ash that they used, it has a higher resistance to salt water. So to, I'm just... to, to reject, I was wrong. Asphalt is literally just its own thing. It's a semi-viscous, semi-full uh, solid of petroleum. It's a kind of a different type of petroleum. Sorry. I thought for some reason tar and asphalt were synonymous, but I guess they are not. Gotcha. So... But uh, the Roman concrete is far superior to our concrete in resistance to seawater. They and didn't, then the water they used for their cement was salt water. Yeah. And so I don't know if where, where exactly that resistance comes in. I thought it came from the volcanic ash that they used is what I read, but not super. I mean, it could be the fact that it was made with salt water. Couldn't tell you. Just a wild guess, and it might be the rum talking, but volcanic ash, if I'm thinking like any other lava base, it's extremely porous. Maybe the salt does something with the ash because it to create a different chemical, or maybe the salt gets in the pores of the ash or volcanic rock. I don't know. That's just throwing shit at the wall and seeing what sticks. Yeah, I can tell you. Just just noting it, I guess. I don't know where I was going with that. Well, speaking of Rome and modern day, you know what's another big difference, Nick? In Rome, they weren't cooking themselves with cement. In cities today, we are. So I didn't know this was a thing until coming to researching this, but urban heat islands. So in case people don't know, rock's pretty good at holding heat. So if you heat it up really well, it slowly dissipates. I mean, if you go to... I don't know, uh, the desert, like Arizona, those rocks get really fucking hot. There's a reason why you can say you could cook an egg on the road and all those idioms. But with cities, because there's so much concrete, not a lot of airflow, not a lot of movement, it's creating heat pockets, hence the word islands, in these cities that is raising the temperature, I think, by 20 degrees, if I remember correctly, that'd be Fahrenheit, which makes everything work less efficient. I mean, it meant, like... Uh, look at texas during the great freeze the windmills broke because we didn't plan for them to get that cold i imagine as a civil engineer you're not planning for the cement to be you know 140 degrees when you're when, when you're pouring it it's got that's got to play a huge factor now also how compact all that cement is in the location they gotta be bumping into each other cracking each other rubbing against each other like titanic plates almost yeah i mean i guess it's it's all those little things that are going on at the same time uh it just it uh, the so the whole concrete thing kind of reminds me of um I'm trying to think of what the episode we did was about uh like the mass mass earth movements and kind of stuff with all the different little things like the plates moving against each other, the the little erosion that takes place all the time, but just on a smaller scale. Are you talking about massive earth changing catastrophes? I believe so. 
but just small catastrophes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know if you count Los Angeles or New York as a small catastrophes, but they're definitely a catastrophes. Yeah. And the other thing is like uh, a good example for like rocks holding heat. So on a fire, like a wildfire, and you're going to check for smoke, you take a thermal camera out in like the middle of the night because everything's cooled off by then. But you have to distinguish from heat from rocks because the rocks are holding the heat of the day. So if you can hit it right around dawn when the rocks are about the, they've cooled off for the night, but they haven't been warmed up by the sun of the next day yet, then they're more shaded in with the rest of everything else. But if you go like right as the sun goes down, like, you know, at 8 30, 9 o'clock, like the sun just went down, the rocks will glow red hot because they're holding all that heat from the day. And so it's hard to distinguish them from actual fire because they're all hot. Who would have thunk it, Nick, that uh, rocks hold heat? It's a, it's a, that's a weird thing to talk about. Like something as hard as a rock but can still absorb heat. It's it's really weird. I don't know why. That's really weird to me that something so solid, so hard can transfer heat and store heat so well. But to kind of tie it in a little bit between the Portland cement, the Romans, urban cities and heat is a key factor that we have yet to talk about which is water water is huge for concrete it's a water is probably the most important molecule i well i yeah i'm just gonna say water is the most important molecule on earth we need it to survive and we use it constantly to create and this is where things kind of a little weird so the one of the great things about concrete is when you mix it with water It's soupy. It's a liquid. You can pour it into different shapes. You can pour it into curves. You can pour it into spheres. You can pour it into large areas. It's it's really nice, especially when you have rebar. It's almost like a grid pattern. You can pour it in between the cracks. You don't have to compact it as much. That being said, usually, now take this with a grain of salt so it depends on what your use is for, but the less water, the better. But Another interesting feature that's used in modern cement is additives. So if you ever bought quick dry cement, you probably, there's probably an additive in there. So you have your basic cement, your aggregate, which is crushed rocks, sand, uh, clinker, which is burned limestone and clay, and you need to add water. Well, depending on how much water you need to add is depending how much additive. The more additive that's in there, makes the water more viscous so it travels more so you get more bang for your buck so if i had let's just say i had a pint glass full of cement i would need a pint full of water to make it an even mixture if i have an additive though i can do the same job with only a shot glass of water instead of a pint full glass of water which is huge in the civil engineering world in the engineering world because Less water, which is a high commodity, especially if you're a developing country, and it allows you to do things in different locations. Like, imagine trying to build in, I don't know, say, Egypt. We talked about Egypt earlier. If you're in the middle of Egypt, it might be hard to pump water to get cement structures being built. Well, less water means the project gets done faster. And that's a very big thing. Water... Water is the activation for cement. It's uh, And it's another big reason why it takes so long to dry. Water gets in throughout everything, creates a slushy mess, and as it dries, the outside dries first, and it doesn't dry evenly all the way through. So outside becomes harder, softer, than gooey inside. It takes a long time to do that. It takes a long time for that water to evaporate and turn that cement and concrete into solid rock. So I guess the question then would be, what I mean, what are these additives made of? That are they actually offsetting, like the cost of the water? You know, as a mechanical engineer, I have no idea. I probably should have looked into this. I know they are either a powder or a liquid form. It's uh, well, it's mainly if I remember correctly, like fly ash and silica. Uh, they call it as a quick Google. So take this a grain of salt. Couldn't re- can't back this up, but Pozzolanus. I assume that's Italian or Latin. 
So they probably named it after something the Romans did. Well, that's the kind of concrete the Romans use, Pozzolani, I think. So maybe that additive allows it to be more, it needs less water, perhaps. I don't know. Maybe that's maybe that's why a major factor of why Roman structures still exist today is because they use the least amount of water into creating their structures. Right. Isn't, oh man, I forgot. Isn't the more water, you, the less water you use, the lo- the harder it is, but it takes longer to cure or something like that? Uh, yeah. Well, I don't know about longer to cure, but usually the less water, the stronger it is. And it, but usually you have to compact it then it's less soupy. So you can't pour it in as complicated structures without a lot more work. But yeah, from what I remember working construction is the least amount of water is the strongest, but if it's a thick enough slab and you're just doing a driveway, it doesn't fucking matter. (laughs) Now, Nick, not to get my rocks off the dunch. But you do know I love advancements in science. And as nerdy as this is, there's advancements in concrete. Like I said, sand's disappearing. Water's becoming a more valuable resource. And, well, things aren't built like they used to anymore. And if, I'm not, if you're ready, I'd like to talk into the future of concrete. I want to have one quick interjection here on the future of concrete. I did see, I don't know if you saw this. But supposedly, and I don't know what exactly they mean by concrete industry, but supposedly the concrete industry wants to be carbon neutral by 2050. Uh, good fucking luck. Right? Uh, that's, that's just a publicity stunt, right? Like, there's no way they can actually believe that. There's, uh, (laughs) unless, like, they have a super thing that they're hiding from the the entire world right now that's going to be announced. I, there's no way. There's no way. Yeah, I mean, the only, so I don't know if you heard of Solidia. No, I don't know what that is. It's a, it's a company that's planning to take CO2 from the atmosphere and then inject it into the concrete to dry out the concrete to help reduce water and not put off as much CO2 as it dries, which to me just seems like extra steps. I, I have heard about this. So something we didn't talk about is uh, cement is a heavy COD producer. So imagine this. You got to pump the water. The engines need cement. You need to carry, you need to pick up sand that takes, to make cement, that takes CO2. You need to transport all the stuff that takes CO2. You need to mix all the stuff that takes CO2. You need to burn the, the additives, the clinker to go into concrete that takes co2 you need to then build which takes co2 and then after all that's poured cement will continue to release co2 as it solidifies a byproduct i mean what the uh, concrete ca so calcium oxide right ca o3 no oh3 i don't remember so as cement dries it produces more carbon dioxide which kind of releases into the earth which another that's another big reason why concrete fails is sometimes just a carbon dioxide bubble happens inside and breaks up makes a micro crack micro fractures but i have heard about capturing co2 in cement now there are rocks that capture co2 i think olivine is the major one that i know of but i think it needs an added an acid added an acid additive to operate but it's and i think it turns carbon dioxide into carbon and some other base i don't remember what but i i can't see them being carbon neutral by 2050 there's no way like i i if if there's a betting pool on this i'm betting against oh yeah me too i just that's why that's why i brought it up well lots of people are trying to make concrete more economical and produce less carbon so Yes, there are companies that are trying to make put carbon in rocks, which it seems like it's kind of a defeating purpose if you're in the U.S. and you have the Department of Transportation changing the concrete every three years. But a team from Rutgers University and Binghamton University, definitely didn't say those right, have been experimenting with self-healing cement. They use mushrooms. The main fungus being used is trichoderma rhesus i'm pretty sure it's rhesus it's r-e-e-s-e-i not quite else how to say that but this fungus 
promotes the formation of calcium carbonate. So, yeah, calcium carbonate is CaO3. So I, I was wrong about the oxide part, but I was right about the formula part, which is a big, which is a big part of the strength in cement, concrete. Yeah, you get you get what I'm saying. And the current issue with this right now is the mushroom itself. Its pores are four micrometers in diameter, which is bigger than the gaps currently in current cement. So you have to make current air, you have to make air bubbles in cement to help promote self-healing concrete, which is possible. I mean, uh, one of the strongest, well, not the one of the strongest, a very strong structures is metal foam, which is air bubbles in, in, in metal. And I imagine it's the same for rocks too, if you're able to do controlled air bubbles across, but Nick, imagine a day where there's no more construction and roads aren't closed off because the government built a road that actually could last and heal itself. I think there's a few things that I think are more believable than that. One of them is communism as a good system of government. <laughs> hang on let me ask you a question what do you think is more possible <laughs> self-healing roads that and the government builds good roads or <laughs> that there'll be a concrete will be carbon neutral by 2050 i will say it is more likely that nancy pelosi did not engage in insider trading than either of those things happening <laughs> <laughs> yeah you're Unfortunately, probably right. And I know people are going to think about it, but yes, mushroom bricks exist. Yes, hemp bricks exist. We talked about them in hemp, but they're not as good as the real thing. Those organic materials are not as strong as rock. They're great for like insulators. They're great for inside stuff, but to build highways, you can't. To build skyscrapers, you can't. We need stuff that is hard as rock. Hence why we're using rock. But speaking of air bubbles in cement, there's a company kind of already doing that. It's an Italian company. Funny how that full circle comes around Italy with cement and the current Italy company kind of making innovations. It's called Bubble Deck, the company's name, which is kind of appropriate for what they do. So imagine you're pouring cement. So you have your, we'll just make it simple. Say you have a wooden frame to make a, a, a pathway, a driveway. And you're putting your rebar in, you know, it's a grid pattern, certain distances from, I think it's like three inches from the edges. And then based on your lengths and certain ties you have to do. Now, this company comes wrong. It makes this plastic ball. This plastic ball goes in the middle. So not the bottom, not the top, but in the middle. What this does is as the cement's being poured, these plastic balls displace the cement, creating one arches in the cement arches are extremely strong so you're keeping the same strength without as much material being poured two you're not using as much material which means less water less rock less carbon dioxide being produced and three it's also lighter now so i'm wondering on if it's starting to use for vertical building say aka skyscrapers on how tall you can actually build if you're getting the same strength of cement but you're saving 25% of the weight. I mean, that seems like a pretty simple idea. It seems to be, and it's already been in markets. It's already being used. I believe it's already internationally used. So who knows? Maybe we'll see that. Maybe we'll see the DOT use that soon, but I'll doubt it. Another interesting thing I came across is give up on the current formula. You know, you can do the same thing over and over again and change it so many times until you need to make a new dish. Well, a, Scientist team at Nayang Technical University in Singapore. Fun fact, I think it's Singapore that lost a bunch of their islands from the illegal sand trade. So I think a bunch of people stole smaller islands off their coast of sand and now the islands completely all the islands are completely eroded and flooded. So I think it so sand's kind of important to Singapore, especially if you're an island. But they found an interesting way of making cement with industrial carbide, sludge, and urea. For those who don't know, industrial carbide sludge is waste from acetylene gas, which is a very commonly used item, and urea is mammal pee. So you might be walking on the structure of rocks, piss, and sludge, and it might be better than using rocks, water, and limestone. 
I mean, I don't care. It's already been used. Might as well use it again. True, true, true. Another big thing is the recycling of concrete. Like I said, we have ways to make sand, which is crushing pre-existing rocks into more marine-like sand, which people tend not to like because it's water at different colors that is not interesting with the way sand's disappearing and the way that how much we need to change how much cement carbon dioxide we're producing. We might have to suck it up and just enjoy the color. But this is really cool to me. I didn't know that. No, this thing exists. So in recycling cement, now it's not every facility, but they have giant electromagnets that can literally pull the steel out of concrete. You know how much fucking force that has to take? So what's... What's the point of that? So you set it and then you pull it out or just No. So say your say your road's gotta be replaced by your state government. They'll break it up with jackhammers and sledgehammers and stuff like that, take that rubble to a recycling place and get back the aggregate and the limestone so they don't have to use as much new materials in repro- in raking cement. Gotcha. Um from what I can tell, this process is still not the most efficient nor cost effective, like most recycling, unfortunately. But new technology is on the rise. But all these new things, all these new features, and I haven't gotten to the crazy ones yet. And I, I want to point this out. Government is really good at moving slow. And also changing construction practices is extremely hard to do. Regulations in cement are are slower than it takes for cement to cure. It took nearly 25, per, 25 years to change the percent of limestone allowed in concrete. And nobody wants to use a new material that's kind of new age, untested, and build a structure where it might kill people if they fuck up. So everyone's a little bit scared and hesitant to uh, try new things. Yeah, well, and more an interesting tidbit about how big the concrete industry is, that most of the funding for NOAA and shit comes from the construction industry so that they can forecast when it's going to rain and temperatures for settling concrete. And so even just advancements in that is helping concrete. But yeah, it's just, uh, I don't know, something you said kind of made me think of that. Well, thinking of scale, you know who re-sands our beaches, Nick? No idea. It's the Army Engineers. That's a big part of it in America is the army engineers pumping sand onto the beaches so homes aren't destroyed, civilization isn't destroyed. I mean, a big part of why Hurricane Ida, I believe, in in Houston got hit so hard is uh, a bunch of sand is pulled out of the rivers around there. And most scientists say that made it worse when the floods came, the hurricane came. Now, I don't know if you want to, but I came up with some crazy ideas And I would like to get your opinion on them. Sure. When I think rocks, I think when I think strength, I think crystals. I think crystalline structures are extremely strong. I mean, look at quartz. Quartz is basically sand, just crushed up and small. So why not have crystalline structures in concrete? Why not, instead of using, I don't know, aggregate or sand... Why don't we use crystals to reinforce it, to make it stronger, to make it last longer? I imagine the hardness of a crystal is stronger than most, like I'm just thinking quartz on the top of my head, is stronger than most rock. And with modern technology, we're even able to grow our own diamonds. Why don't we advance the technology to grow our own crystals to add it into the concrete building world? And if we don't want to do that, why not add ceramics into the mix? So ceramics being clay that's fired, ceramics are extremely strong. They're brittle, but extremely strong. So for those who don't know, like you've probably seen cars on cinder blocks. Well, cinder blocks are pretty much ceramics. They're very good at holding a hot, heavy force, but as soon as a force comes that's moving or at an angle and are not perfectly vertical or linear with its structure... It cracks. That's the kind of the weakness of ceramics. So maybe we could do a combo. And Nick, since we keep bringing back old episodes and we're still talking about crystalline structures, the nuclear waste episode, I brought up bismuth of storing 
nuclear waste because how long of bismuth's half-life is well bismuth we can grow bismuth is an well it's an element but we can grow its crystalline structure why can't we add bismuth to our roads a material with an extremely long half-life in the road seems like a long-lasting road of course the roads could just be a business to get more money moving more taxpayers paying more money and they don't really actually want the roads to last a long time but that just might be me wearing a tinfoil hat. I get. I don't know enough about bismuth. I mean, is it as strong as, like, will it stand up to the... Well, off the top of my head, if I remember correctly, the ultimate tensile strength... No, the ultimate strength? Fuck. I'm, my engineering teachers are yelling and flipping in the graves. The ultimate strength for concrete, I think, is 40 megapascals. I think for bismuth on its own is only two pascals or four pascals. But much like cement, it doesn't just have to be one structure. Why don't we have that as an additive? Why don't we have that as an aggregate? Why don't we have that as a part of the material in the recipe? I don't know. I, I mean, don't, I feel like, like because it, that part would probably outlast the rest of it, then you're just left with a bunch of that. You don't know what to do. It with sounds it. like it makes it, it makes it, sounds like it makes it easier to recycle it. Yeah, I don't know. And plus, and plus you can just turn pismal bismuth back into isn't it pepnol bismol right that's that's pretty much just 100 percent bismuth i have no idea what is in pepto bismol <laughs> touche touche my last crazy idea is why don't we just melt rocks why don't we break up lava rocks and put it in as an additive or why don't we just melt rock we can melt rocks rocks aren't that hard to melt you can use it with a oh what's it called not a striking torch not an iron. It's an it's a it's a steel rod with oxygen pumped through. Not a thermite stick. Oh God. Well, we can melt rocks, and I'm wondering, is melted rock stronger for it? Like uh, like a. Uh, this is just all hypothetical. Imagine, imagine we had a certain type of rock we use as aggregates in the concrete. So, let's just say we'll just stick with plain old limestone or gravel. Well, what if an after feature of after you, I don't know, you, you, you place it and it dries a little bit, why don't you add like a, a bulldozer with like a strong electromagnet conducting magnet to use conduction to heat the rocks and melt it a little bit? Wouldn't that make it stronger, more solidified, heat all the way through? when the rocks melt into a more linear and stronger structure? So instead of it being tiny thousand pieces all jagged enough as a puzzle piece they melt together to be its own structure almost like um if if you ever seen glass hit by lightning it uh, sorry sand hit by lightning it becomes glass or obsidian why not do something like that i'm guessing it's more energy intensive could not literally could not tell you well these are just my random ideas i have no evidence no proof there's food for thought, and I figured I'd get them out there considering, one, people are dying because of sand mafias. Two, water wars are a real possibility in the near future. Three, mild carbon dioxide produced by cement and concrete is ridiculous. Four, we use a lot of it. We should probably make it the most efficient we can. And five, I am so tired of roads that are constantly under construction. It drives me crazy. Just fucking fix it once and do it right or plan ahead so you can understand how to make the traffic move better so you're not bogging up traffic. Of course, that shit might be a pet peeve of mine. I mean, it's mostly for reason five, right? If I'm guessing. A <laughs> uh, little column A, a little column B, but a lot more column B. I just wanted to bring the attention a lot of this is something we walk on, we drive on, we live in. And a lot of people don't know where it comes from. People don't know wars are nearly fought for it. The amount of money, billions if not trillions of dollars in total, if you count all the moving pieces, are being spread around. Countries are importing. People are stealing. People are like, – it's just how many lives, businesses are affected by concrete and cement. I have no idea how to quantify that. And I feel like something that important in our everyday lives deserved to be a little bit more in the limelight. 
And that's pretty much why I kind of wanted to do this episode. And Nick, I hope I didn't bore you too much with doing this topic. I mean, it's not the most exciting con- exciting topic we've done, but I I think it was more interesting than I thought it was going to be. Like when you put concrete on the list, I was like, "Are you fucking kidding me?" I, I I might be dumb, I might be crazy, but a blind squirrel finds a nut once in a while. Mike, what are you reading? Uh, I still have yet to start it, but uh, uh, Discipline by Jocko Willink. Uh, I have yet to, to start it, but hey, at least I finished a book <laughs> so that was sitting on my nightstand forever. What about you, Nick? What are you reading? Uh, I just got a new book in the mail that I'm going to start called Resource Allocation and Conifers. It is just not super exciting. <laughs> you go from conif- you go from cement to conifers. Let's go. One of those things is super interesting, and the other of those things <laughs> is cement. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, don't get any concrete ideas, Nick, on what's interesting and not interesting. Yep, there it is. Oh, uh, come on. That's a good one. That's a good one. Oh, uh, I've been sprinkling those like gravel throughout the entire episode. I didn't even said catch anything. him. I didn't even catch uh, him. That's why. Oh, I, man. He just went in so naturally. I'm a smooth operator. But I have a question for everyone listening of what's the oldest cement or the weirdest thing you've ever made with cement? Or what's a good dumb cement story you've seen or heard about? Like someone accidentally pouring themselves in, someone driving into a freshly poured road, a building collapsing on itself, hopefully with no one in there. I would love to hear those kind of stories. And Nick, where can they tell us those stories? You can find us on Reddit and Instagram. Well, all roads may lead to Rome, but new roads are being paved every day. And with that being said, thank you all for listening. Thanks for listening to the Backyard Philosophy Podcast. We rarely finish a podcast without missing a point we wanted to bring up, so let us know what we forgot. And if you have a topic you want us to talk about, let us know at Backyard Philosophy on Instagram and Backyard Philosophy Podcast on